So we are uh, in this third week of a series in the book of Philippians, and we're looking about what it means to grow up in our, our faith and uh, what, that, what that looks like for each one of us. <clears throat> uh, since today's Valentine's Day and I was thinking about uh, love and just my marriage, uh, I, I was thinking about the first time I really ever talked to my wife, and some of you maybe have heard this story before, um, and so I apologize if you have, but it's one of my favorite stories, and, um, and so I, I remember when I got to college, I, I remember seeing my wife, Heather, and uh, I remember thinking she was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life, and I was like, I've got to meet her, I'm going to, uh, to date her and to marry her. And so uh, both of us were kind of at some point shy and didn't necessarily have lots of conversations. And so we kind of do the wave at each other and wouldn't really say much. And so, I, you know, I was kind of picking up some vibes, like maybe she was into me. And so I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, uh, make this happen. And at the time, I was a PE major. And so I was taking classes like how to teach individual dual sports. So that means like uh, how to teach someone to play ping pong. And uh, how, I was taking really difficult classes. And so I was never in the library uh, but my wife is a nurse, and so I knew that she was always in the library. And so I thought, okay, I'm just going to go and pretend. I'm just going to go, and I'm going to sit in the library, and I'm going to pretend to be studying. And, and now we have a name for that, and we call those people creepers or creepy. Um, and so uh, I was, you know, an original creeper. And so I would just go, and I would just, like, kind of watch. And so I finally got the boldness. And, I, and I, again, I thought, man, she's into me. She likes me. And so, okay, I'm going to go, go talk to her. And so I build up my courage, and I go, and I, she's sitting at a table, and I can still picture it, and I think, okay, this is the start. And so I go, and I sit down, and I, hey, Heather, how's it going? And she's like, fine. I'm like, whoa, what? So she totally blows me off, completely blows me off, doesn't give me hardly any attention. That, she probably has a different story, but, but that's what happened. She totally blows me off. And so I leave, I leave thinking, okay, that, that's it. That's it. I'm never getting married. I'm never going to be happy. <laughs> nothing's going nothing's to ever be good in my life. And so uh, eventually things worked out. And now that I know Heather, she was shy and bashful. But, but here's the deal. It really wasn't about me going and approaching Heather. It didn't matter. I could have had the smoothest lines. I could have said the best things. It all depended on one thing, and that was her response. That's it. it again, it didn't matter what I said. It didn't matter what I did. It didn't matter what I believed. It didn't matter what truth was there. The only thing that mattered was how would she respond. And so as I was, I was thinking about it, I was like, man, that, that, is, that is what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about in this series is how will you respond to the gospel message? How will you respond to it? It, it, it really doesn't matter how it's presented. It doesn't matter what Paul even says. The question is how will you choose to respond? And I know in a, in a, in a space of size, you're, you're all over the place when it comes to your faith and what you believe, but... But here's what I know to be true, is that each one of us has to respond to it. Each one of us. We have to respond to the gospel message. And for some of you, you're like, you know what, I don't really know what the gospel means or what that looks like. And, and one easy way we talk about it, one, one of the best ways I've heard it described is the gospel means that everyone is broken. Everyone is broken. You're broken, I'm broken. We've sinned, we've disobeyed, we've gone against what God wants us to do. And even if you find yourself here today and you would say, you know what, I don't know if I believe in God. I promise you there's been these moments where you've made a decision and you wish you wouldn't have. You've made a choice and you felt regret, you felt shame, you wish you would have made a different decision. And and honestly, that's God speaking to you. You may not have known that, you may not even believe that, but but for us, that's what we believe, that that, that's this presence of God even drawing you in in those those moments. And so I I don't know where you're at, I don't know what you believe, but, but there's this opportunity to respond to the message. And so everyone is broken, but everybody is loved. Everyone is broken, Everybody is loved. You are deeply loved by God, even in the midst of your brokenness. While you were still sinners, while you were still broken, Christ died for you. And, and so that, that's the gospel, that, that Jesus has come to rescue and to save and to redeem all people, all people, when we make this decision to, to believe it and to follow it, to respond. And so if, if you want to go back, <coughs> I apologize, if you want to go back and watch the previous messages, I go in, into deeper teaching into what the first church looks like here in Philippi and, and where we find ourselves in Philippi. But, but in that beginning, there's say that these people responded to Paul's message, that there was a response. And so we have to begin to ask ourselves, are we re- Is it having an impact in our lives? And so this week, we're going to look at a pretty large chunk of of Scripture. It's found in uh, Philippians, Philippians 1. If you don't have a Bible, there's a red Bible around you somewhere. Please take that. That's our gift to you. 
We're going to look at Philippians 1, 12 through 30. Philippians 1, 12 through 30. Uh, the first big chunk I'm going to uh, teach through fairly quickly, and then we're going to hone in at the end. And uh, th- this message really is targeted to you if you call yourself a Christian. If you're here today and you're like, you know what, I don't know if I'm a Christian, I don't know if I believe. Sit back, relax, listen to what it means to follow Jesus. Listen to this guy named Paul who was a Christian and his life experiences, and then this challenge that he presents to this group of Christians. But if you find yourself here today and you say, I am a Christian, this message is directly targeted to you and, and to myself. So I'm going to read it, and then I'll go back and, and do teaching. Philippians 1, starting in verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that he could stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Would you pray again with me? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that we find here. Thank you for Paul's life. Uh, help us to, uh, to focus in on what Paul's teaching here. Help us to understand how that impacts us, not just someone 2,000 years ago, but how it's a challenge for us today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, going back to verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Verse 13. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Paul is saying, look, I, I'm imprisoned, I've been persecuted, I find myself in the inner cell for a reason, and for one reason, and that is to advance the gospel. Paul is saying, I am in chains. I could possibly lose my life, but you know what? It's for one reason, and that is that so more people will hear the good news of Jesus, that everyone is broken, that everyone is loved. And then he goes on and he says, look, everyone in the palace guard Everyone knows that I'm in chains for Christ. Now, in some study, I realized there was about 9,000 people who would have been involved in the palace guard. Now, there's no way that Paul by himself from this inner cell chained up could have an impact on 9,000 people, could he? I mean, that's unbelievable. But here's what happens. Paul begins to preach the gospel. Just begins to preach the gospel. He begins to preach to the people who are around him. And then something begins to happen in their hearts. And you know what they do? They go and begin to share. And then they go and begin to share. And it says the whole palace guard has heard the good news of the gospel. That no enemy, that nothing could come against the gospel. Nothing. Like there's times I think we're afraid that something's going to go wrong. That something in government or something in our world, something is going to quench the good news of the gospel. That we need certain things to happen for the good news to go out. But that's not true. That's true. Nothing is going to quench, nothing is going to squelch the good news of the gospel. Nothing. 
They think, okay, we're going to put Paul into prison. But what happens? Paul says, well, I'm in here for a reason. Something good is going to come from this. And the entire guard hears about it. What seems to come against the spreading of the gospel actually allows it to spread. I mean, think about that. They want Paul to be quiet. Paul's in prison because he's teaching about Jesus. And so, like, okay, we're going to quiet this guy up. And so they put him in to prison. And then who hears about it? The Roman guards. The Roman rulers, the people with power, they begin to hear the good news. Nothing could come against the gospel. Verse 14. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. They're now becoming bold. Other believers, other people who are followers of Jesus are beginning to be, beginning to be courageous and have boldness because they see what Paul is doing. They've seen what Paul is going through and they're saying, if Paul can do this, then why am I not bold? Why am I not courageous? Why am I not sharing the good news with other people? So they've become confident. And this is what I started to think about. In the church, often what happens is people think, well, that's not my job. Like, it's not, it's not my job to go and tell people about Jesus. It's not my job to go spread the gospel. Like, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to love kids. I'm going to go help with children, and I'll do that part, or I'm going to greet, and all that stuff is much needed. But there's points, especially within the church, where we say, look, that's, that's not my job. And if you have a job, if you work, there's probably things in your job where you're like, that is not my job. That's someone else's job. Someone else is supposed to do that. And usually it's for two reasons, as I thought about this. It's two reasons. One is we think we're too good to do that. Ah, that's, that's someone else's pay grade. I'm, I'm above that. Okay, but I don't think that's what, what normally goes on. The other thing that happens is what we say is, I'm not adequate enough to do that. I don't have the ability. That's not my job. I can't do that. I don't know if you've seen, there, there's actually uh, these hashtags, not my job. And I, and I found some pictures this week I thought was really funny. Uh, or last week, actually. Uh, we'll show these, these few pictures here. So these are pictures of people where they see something that's gone wrong, and it's like, well, why didn't they just move the bike and paint and put the bike back? And so they title it, Not My Job. And then here's another one. <laughs> right? I mean, it's not my job to get out and move the tree. I'm just going to go around it. And then this is one of my favorite ones. I don't think this actually works, if you can see that. Uh, it usually works better if you cut the lemons and then you put it in the, the water, but just dump them in. Right? That's not my job. And so often what happens for us is we feel inadequate. We feel inadequate. We say, look, the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus has done something in my heart, but how am I supposed to share the gospel with anyone else? That's someone else's job. Someone else can do that. Someone who is bold and courageous, who has the right words, they, they speak well. They can do it. But, but Paul here says, look, there's these people who are hearing the message, and their boldness and their courage is just growing, and they're beginning to share the gospel more and more. And so my challenge for you and for myself is how are we continually speaking the gospel? Or are you at all? Like, are you sharing the gospel? And, and usually what happens is when we say that, you would say, I'm not adequate. And what that means is I don't know what to say. I don't know the Bible well enough. What if they ask a question and I don't have the answer? What if I sound dumb? What if I trip over my words? What if they reject me? And so we, we just don't share it. I think hopefully they'll go to church somewhere or hopefully they'll find themselves in a place where someone else will, will share. But what if we all took that personally and we said, if you are a follower of Jesus, that that is our responsibility, that we share the gospel to everyone we come in contact with. And that doesn't mean preaching on the corner, because that's what I used to think, that I was going to have to just be preaching all the time. But if we look at Paul's life, you know what Paul did? He talked about his own life. Paul says, look, I... I at one point was blind, but now I see. I don't, I don't know what else is going on. All, all I know is that, 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 that Jesus has done something in my life. Paul just shares his stories. So when he goes to the, the, the slave girl, when he goes to Lydia, when he goes to the jailer, he's just talking about his own life. And then the response is up to them. As we talked about before, it's up to them to respond. You can't make someone respond. You can't make someone believe. But, but we can just share what God is doing in our own life. That is sharing the gospel. Verse 15. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here 
for the defense of the gospel. This can kind of sound uh, confusing here a little bit. There are these people who are rising up and they're beginning to preach the gospel as well. Some of them did that because they wanted to become the next Paul. They wanted the attention. They wanted the prestige. And so there was this envy of Paul. So there was almost like this idea, okay, great, Paul's now in prison. He's being silent. So now it's my chance. Some did it out of love for Paul and said, all right, this message has to continue to grow. And so I just, me personally, I just want to share uh, that we as a church care about the churches in our community. We do, that, that we don't see the church next door, the church down the street or around the corner as our enemy. We're not envious of those churches. We want those churches to do well. When a person comes and follows Jesus at another church, we celebrate. It doesn't matter. We, we are all in this together. We are in this to spread the gospel in our community and to change our community together. Churches doing it together. And so I, I, don't, I don't care who gets the credit. And then the other thing is this is not about me. This is not about me. So like you'll never see my wife and I on a billboard and, and this is not about us. This is not about us. This is about us. Okay, this is about us. And so when, when, when Paul's talking about this, Paul's like, you know what, there's some people who are doing this out of selfish ambition and there's some doing it for this deep love. We, we do this because we know we've been loved and we have a deep love for the people around us. Verse 17. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through my prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. i got to be honest. Paul kind of upsets me at times because I'm thinking, how does Paul live this way? Paul's in chains. Now there's people kind of coming against him who want to take over for their own selfish ambitions. And Paul's like, okay. Okay. If it's going to make Christ known, that, that is what's most important. Paul says, I'm going to rejoice in the midst of it. And I started thinking about my own life. And I'm like, man, when things go wrong and I'm, I'm having difficulty or when I'm sick or I don't know what's happening to me, that, that, my first response isn't always to rejoice. But Paul, as we continue to read this, you're going to continue to see this, that he's hopeful in the midst of persecution and that he's rejoicing while he's in, he's in prison. Paul's way of life just seems crazy. It just seems crazy. And so as I think about you, and I know some of the situations that many of you are going through, I know how difficult that can be. But Paul is choosing to rejoice. And he's confident in the end. He's confident in the end that no matter what happens, it will end with him being saved and Christ being exalted. So Paul says, even if I lose my life, we're going to see that in a minute, even if I lose my life, well then Christ is exalted. So it doesn't really matter. Verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way ashamed, but will have Courage. Now, the culture during this time would have very much elevated honor and it avoided anything that showed public disgrace. You would never want to be disgraced in public. I mean, that's not that different than what we experience today. But Paul is thinking, man, I've, I've already been disgraced. I've already been pulled out in the square. I've been beaten. I've been abused. There's been these opportunities for, for people to punish me, for me to be disgraced. And Paul has this moment where he says, look, I eagerly expect and hope that in no way that he'll be ashamed. He's not going to be ashamed. But he'll be confident so that now as always Christ will be exalted. That no matter what, that no matter what, he is going to exalt Christ. That Paul actually believes that God will use this situation and circumstances to bring about good for either Paul or for the Philippians. Paul's like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but, but whatever happens to me, I know that good will come for himself or for those who are reading this, the Philippians. Paul isn't merely talking about being saved and getting out of prison. He's not talking about being vindicated by Roman rulers and set free. He's talking about eternity. Paul, more than anyone that we maybe read about other than Jesus, he has his mind set for what's next. He has his mind set for what's next, and he believes that his, his future is in eternity with, with God. And so for him, he's like, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. 
that my life is not about what's happening here in now. 21, and he says this, for me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul becomes very personal and very intimate in this moment in the next couple of, of verses. He understands the place he finds himself is probably not going to end well for him. And we read because of other historians, not in the scriptures, but other historians, that Paul eventually loses his, his life and is decapitated. And so Paul knows. Paul knows. Paul says this isn't going to probably end well. But for him, he says, to live is Christ. He says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Paul says, my life is no longer my own. I'm a follower of Jesus. Christ is in me. This life I live is his. So to live is Christ. And to die is to gain something else, to profit something more. And the gain of the profit is actually to be fully present with Jesus. Again, Paul somehow at some point actually believes that heaven is better than here. Something happens, and Paul actually believes it, and he believes it so much that it impacts his life. And so he says, to live for me is Christ, to die I even gain. But for us, I wonder if we were to finish that statement, to live is. Some of us would say, man, to live is my job. My life is completely about my job. It's completely about being successful. It's completely about getting recognized. To live is to get more stuff. That's the only reason I do anything is because I want more. I want more satisfaction. I want more things. To live is to be rich. My, my son, Cade, who's five, he wants to be a chef. He wants to open uh, Cade's Cafe one of these days. He wants to own a restaurant. So we're eating the other day, and he's like, oh, I'm going to have this at my restaurant. And I'm like, oh, that's great. You, you know, that's going to be a lot of fun. He goes, I can't wait to have a restaurant. I'm like, why? He goes, so I can be rich. It's like, oh, all right, you're going to have a good restaurant. Okay. Dad's going to need some help when I'm old, so that works. Uh, financially, and so I'm like, oh, that's great. Why do you want to be rich? So I can buy more toys. I saw my more toys. So even for him as a five-year-old, there's this, just something in him, even, well, we're not, I mean, we're rich compared to the world, but we're not, we're not rich, rich, right? And so for him, it's like at some point in his heart, he's like, man, if I just had more, if I just had more. And so for many of us, to live, to live is to get more, to be rich. To live is to see my kids succeed. My kids can just succeed. To live is to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend or to eventually get them to, to marry you. But Paul says to live is Christ. To live is Christ. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is secondary. N nothing else really, really matters. And then he ends that by saying to die is gain, to be in the presence of Christ. Verse 22. If I am to go on living in the body... This will mean fruitful labor for me. Paul just says, look, I'm, if I keep living, fruit's going to keep being produced. More people are going to hear the good news. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. He begins to have this internal struggle. It's almost like he, for me, like he didn't almost mean to write this down. It's like he just is trying to figure out what's, what's best for him. Like he wants to keep on living, but he also is just ready to be done. Like he had this mindset, he's just worn out, he's tired, he's broken. He says, look, it's this, this struggle that I, I face. I, I'm torn between the two. But here's what's amazing is he puts the, the interest of others above even his own interests. Paul's saying, man, be ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to die. I'm ready to go. But he, he knew that suffering would mean that more people would come to know Jesus. Verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. So we, we have this chunk here and there's, there's one kind of theme I, I want to pull out because I, I think that many of you need to hear this today. And that's this idea of having perspective in adverse circumstances. That, that what is our perspective when things go wrong in our life? See, this entire personal reflection that Paul gives stands on this bedrock, this belief that God is actually in control and uses human circumstances, even the darkest ones, for his glory. Paul actually believes that. That his struggles, his persecution, everything that's going on, that God is going to use that. So what is it for you? And I don't say this lightly. I don't say this lightly. 
it sickness? Is it despair? Is it a bad diagnosis? Is it poverty? Is it suffering? Is it family not understanding your faith? As, as, as ladies have an opportunity to hear from our, our own Tony Webb next week, as she talks about growing up as a Muslim and the way she was treated, like, what is it for you? What's against you? What if? What if actually in the midst of that, in the midst of that difficulty, in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of that persecution of difficult times, that that God could actually be glorified? And not only would he be glorified, but people around you would begin to take notice. And other people would begin to ask questions, and it would be an opportunity for you to share the hope that you have. Now, we don't always get this in the Western world. Like in other parts of the world where it's either illegal to be a follower of Jesus or, or people are literally daily losing their lives for what they believe, the church is growing like crazy. In the Western world, all the things I read, and I read all the time, they keep talking about the church is dying and people aren't following Jesus anymore. Where people are losing their life to follow Jesus, the church is growing like crazy. Like one of my favorite authors, his name is Francis Chan. And uh, he, he does a lot of work in China and different places. And he said he was once talking to uh, these, these Christians in the underground persecuted church in, in China. And uh, Francis Chan was like, okay, well, how do you deal with the people who call themselves Christians, but they don't really live it out? And they laughed at him. They laughed at him. He's like, no, 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 no. People, people don't do that. If you, if you call yourself a Christian, it's because you actually believe it and then your life reflects it and then more than likely you'll be persecuted and possibly lose their life. So why would anyone just call themselves a Christian? Yeah. Right? And so we have to understand that, that us in the Western world, that we're going to face persecution. It just may look different. And there's going to be difficult things that go on in your life. Even if you are a follower of Jesus, everything's not going to go well. But what if we can begin to see that and say, all right, what if I could bring glory to God in the midst of what's going on? Because your story is just a part of God's grander story that's happening. Okay, now Paul's going to take a shift, and we're going to end with, with this, uh, really just one verse. I'm going to read, read 27 through 30, but we're going to hone in on, on 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Verse 27. Whatever happens. So he's going to switch, and he's, going to been, he's been talking about his own life. Now he's going to talk to that early church in Philippi. The, the rich woman, Lydia. Probably had everything she needed, everything she ever wanted. The poor girl who was completely out of control and had been owned by the Roman rule and demon-possessed and was a slave. To the jailer, the blue-collar, do the job, punish people when he was told to and probably enjoyed it a lot. Those people. Not only those people, but all the households. Paul's going to, at this moment, and say, whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And I think this is what he's saying. Does your life measure up to what you say you believe? Does your life measure up to what you say you believe? If you, if you were to measure your life and, and, and would you say that the way you've responded measures up? And so I, I was thinking this two weeks ago and I thought, oh, okay, a scale. It's easy to, to kind of see this here. And so if you were to take a scale, there's probably an official name for this kind of scale, but all right? And then we're going to say, this is you. This is a little Lego guy. I'm a dad. And so, uh, so let's say this is, uh, this is you, right? And this is your life. If you were to take this, if you were to take this, what we have from God, the instruction of God, and we say, we believe this, and you were to measure it against your life, does it, does it measure out? Does it measure out? Because this is what I know. This is where you can't separate what you say you believe and then how you behave. We can't say we believe one thing and then behave another way. I was going to say again. We can't say we believe one thing and then behave another way. Not that you're supposed to be perfect. Not that you're supposed to be perfect. But, but the things we say we believe, 
Do we actually live those out in our life? And so I just really, really quickly want to just bring up a few things, all right? Just a few scriptures that, that are really important, and, and they're important because of the way they're, they're written. And then we have to ask ourselves, if we actually believe that, then how does my life measure up to that? James 1.27 uh, James was the half-brother of Jesus. He writes this, uh, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. Okay, this is, I mean, this is pretty important. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. <sighs> James, the half-brother of Jesus who would have watched Jesus live his life, who, who really knew all of his teaching, he basically comes down and says, look, if you want to know what's most important, what's, what's pure and faultless, is to look after the widows and the orphans. He doesn't, say, he doesn't say anything else. He does go on and say, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Right? And so you may not know this, but orphans and widows didn't have a voice. They didn't have a voice. Uh, men ruled the day, and so the widows wouldn't have had a voice. They would have been pushed aside. They wouldn't have been taken care of. And so James says, look, if you want to know what's most important is to take care of the people who don't have a voice take care of the people who don't have a voice. And then if we go over to Matthew, Matthew 25. Matthew 25. It's talking about kind of the end of times, and it says, look, Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to divide the, the sheep and the goats, and he's going he's to put them in, in, in their own areas. And this is going to say, verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Man, we, we could spend a, a, a month going through just that passage right there. Who is the stranger? Who is the stranger? Who, who is the, the, the language of the Bible often uses the foreigner, the alien? How do we take care of those who are poor? Do we make it harder for them? Do, do we judge them? Do we put all these requirements on them before we'll help them? I'm, I don't want to add too much to this because I want to literally just take what Jesus says here. What Jesus says here and then to say if we actually believe that, not adding to it, do we actually believe that, then, then how do we behave? The, you know, years ago there were the bracelets, the WWJD bracelets, and at times it got kind of cheesy and there was, that stuff was everywhere. But the idea of it is so good. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? How would Jesus love the unlovable? How would Jesus love the outcast? How would Jesus love the foreigner, the stranger? How would Jesus love those who are in prison and sick and needy and poor and thirsty? How would Jesus do it? What would Jesus post about those things? So if we say we believe it, if we say we believe it, how does our life measure up to it? How does our life measure up to it? We can go into Matthew and the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. We could look at, well, what does Jesus say about loving our enemies? And listen, uh, not to get too political, but we are in a political time right now. And so we have to say, I'm not concerned about following a Republican idea or a Democrat idea. I'm concerned about following Jesus. I'm concerned about following Jesus. So if I... If this is what I believe, if this is what I believe, I have to ask myself, how does my life measure up to it? Because Paul says, whatever happens, whatever happens to him, whatever happens in your life, if you're persecuted, if you're oppressed, if you're destroyed, just make sure of one thing, that your lives, that your lives are worthy of the gospel. You live in a way that your lives are worthy of what you believe. You can't separate the two. Not that we have to be perfect but we cannot separate the two things. Uh, Brennan Manning, who's one of my, my favorite authors, and he had not a perfect life by any means. If you ever read anything about Brennan Manning, uh, he had all kinds of struggles, and uh, I would encourage you to read some of his stuff. But he said this, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. 
That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. And there's this push, the millennials, the millennial age group, I I promise that this is a problem for them. The the church often talks about how they're not here. And if you're in that age range and you're here, I'm so thankful that you're here. But for many of them, they say, look, I've heard Christians for long, so long say what they believe. But then they don't behave according to what they believe. So if we can, not that we have to be perfect. Let me, I need to reiterate that. We're not going to be perfect. But when we begin to make choices, when we begin to choose to live our lives a certain way, do we do it in a way that is worthy of the gospel? That it's worthy of the gospel. You have to respond. We have to respond to the good news of Jesus, and we have to respond in such a way that it changes our lives. That those around us begin to say they're different. They're different. They actually live out what they say they believe. Let me read this as we end. Uh, Erwin Lutzer tells the following story from an eyewitness in Germany during the Holocaust. I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because we could, because what could we do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning we could hear the whistle in the distance and then the wheels coming over the tracks. We became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the chain, train as it passed by. We realized that it was carrying Jews like cattle in the cars. Week after week, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we would hear the cries of the Jews en route to a death camp. Their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming, and when we heard the whistle blow, we began to sing hymns. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voice. We heard the screams, we sang more loudly, and soon we heard them no more. And then the eyewitness shared with Pastor Lutzer, although years have passed, I still hear the train whistle in my sleep. God forgive me, forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians and yet did nothing to intervene. God forgive us when our lives don't measure up or don't look like what we believe. Pray with me. Father, thank you for the life of Paul, his impact and the, the, the power of his life uh, because he followed you. Uh, would you help us? Would you help me? Uh, will we begin to look at our lives and ask the difficult questions, where in my life does it not measure up, does it not match what I say I believe? God, would you help us? Would you help us to behave in a way that points to who you are. God, would you forgive us when we don't intervene, when we don't stand up for people, when we don't live out what we say we believe. Would you forgive us, Father? And then would you give us the courage and the boldness not to be ashamed, but to speak the good news to the people who are around us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you next week. Love you guys.